Hello everyone and thank you for tuning in again. I am Kaylee Batesman, the Content Director at She Can Code and today we are discussing why supporting social mobility could help close the tech skills gap. Socioeconomic background relates to income and occupation. This includes where you were born and raised, your family history, your level of education and your access to funding or opportunities. It is a major factor in a person's career progression. A recent report from CMI found that 53% of those in management roles are from a high socioeconomic background compared to just 38% from a low socioeconomic background. Now, broadening access to opportunities available is crucial if we are to break down barriers in the workplace and improve social mobility in tech. But how can we buck this trend? And how do we get the confidence to own our own backgrounds to get ahead in tech? Now, today I have the wonderful Dr. Tendu Yogutsu with me today, who is the Chief Technology Officer at Precisely, to give us her thoughts on social mobility and the role that tech businesses can play in driving a more diverse workforce. Welcome, Tendu. Hi, Kaylee. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Thank you so much for joining us. And I know it's early where you are, so thank you so much for, for uh, dialing in today and having a chat. Um, can you start with a little bit of background about yourself, please? Of course. Um, as you mentioned, I'm currently Chief Technology Officer at Precisely. Precisely is the global leader in data integrity. And uh, I started my career actually as a computer engineer. Uh, I was lucky, uh, to your point about the socioeconomic background, I, uh, I am from a family where pretty much everybody is an educator and teacher. My father was a math teacher, so I had this passion about math. I really like, uh, liked uh, and still like math uh, as a child. And uh, at the time, uh, uh, computer engineering, computer science fields were very new and uh, one of my math teachers thought that this might be a good area because it's going to be the future of the jobs uh, in that area. So uh, I had computer engineering degree, uh, followed that with the master's in uh, industrial engineering with focus on business side and operations research. We didn't have data analytics and data science at the time. So operations research and statistics was the closest. And that actually helped me a lot, gaining a little bit more on the economics and financial side of the business, how you can apply technology, which I like. Uh, and then I came to United States for PhD, and uh, I pursued uh, a PhD in computer science, uh, and I started working uh, during this time. I worked during my master's, I worked during my PhD, and uh, after that, I joined a company, SingSort, where I took uh, several engineering and R&D leadership roles. Uh, and uh, I pioneered that company's entry to big data, which uh, was a little bit of stretch for me going out of my comfort zone. And I became general manager leading a global business with all aspects, not just R&D with sales, marketing, uh, and uh, business development and all engineering functions, which became a big step for me to go to the sea level and uh, become a CTO. I kind of gave this as a journey because there are many elements we will probably touch on as we chat today. Yes, and it's so good to hear um, that somebody was interested in STEM and that they studied in tech and wanted to go into tech because uh, I've had lots of ladies on here so far, and it's something that we hear a lot in the tech industry. They fall into technology after several other, other careers. And um, so it's wonderful to hear that that was the plan from the start um, and that you stayed in it. Um, so our uh, discussion today um, is around social mobility. So why is social mobility important in the workplace and in the tech industry specifically? I will tell a bit of a personal story here because I think uh, it's important uh, for uh, everyone to understand. Look at myself. I am from a mid-class family uh, and uh, only one parent was working. And uh, as we all know, educators, teachers, I'm at the like, highest uh, uh, paid uh, people, even though they bring a lot of value to society. And uh, one of my uh, uh, strengths uh, have come from, I was able to have sponsorship scholarship. So during my undergrad, I had full scholarship from Koch Foundation in Turkey. 
During my master's, I had I worked in parallel with my master's in the department as well as outside. So I stretched myself to taking two jobs uh, uh, at once. I had full scholarship coming to United States for my PhD. Now, when we look at tech jobs in particular, actually we have a bigger opportunity, especially now with the remote working environments and ton of ton of free online resources. So uh, one, why is it important in tech industry? Because we are already starting with uh, many underrepresented groups in tech industry. Let's look at the numbers. Uh, we had 18% of computer science majors three decades ago as uh, women. We still have 18%. So we haven't really moved a bit uh, over these uh, multiple decades. Yes. Uh, let's look at the jobs of tomorrow, emerging uh, roles with cloud computing, with uh, data and AI. In cloud computing, women make up 14% of the workforce. This is according to World Economic Forum data. In engineering, 20%. In data and AI, 32%. So we are already starting underrepresented. And COVID, if anything, accelerated automation and digitization. If we don't invest and uh, make STEM fields and in particular technology a priority for uh, these underrepresented groups, in this case, women, because we are talking about women in uh, particular here, we have a risk of actually even going uh, into less representation in the workforce. Yes, so we will be less skilled and we will be in the lower pay grades in a, as opposed to other. So we have an opportunity. So that's one. And then uh, two, we are seeing that again, the World Economic Forum data, an estimated 70% of new value created in the economy over the next decade will be based on digitally enabled platforms and business models. However, 47%, 47% of the world population doesn't have uh, internet connectivity. It's hard to believe that, right? So we have an opportunity uh, with industry, with uh, organizations, technology organizations, and uh, nonprofit organizations and government partnering to have these initiatives so we can actually close this gap and actually contribute to economy. This is going to impact the economy. And then the third is IT occupations in general are associated. Uh, this is a UK-based data point, actually, from one of the research institutes in UK uh, with high level of long-range social mobility. So people who are coming into IT are uh, likely to have a little bit um, higher paid, higher social status than their parents and the IT offers uh, more opportunities with that. Yes, a, a lot of companies, um, they I don't think they think outside the box when it comes to candidates sometimes. Um, and you're right, if we if there's still a skill shortage all these years later, then you know we really do need to make change there. And I was only speaking to a tech recruiter yesterday who said to me, they've stopped looking at education on CVs and they start looking more into soft skills and experience. Um, because you're right, you you we're forever going around in circles and not finding the the talent that we need um, to to push forward. Do do you think it is often overlooked um, when it comes to DNI practices? DNI has many dimensions, right? Diversity, equity, inclusion, and then the dimensions. What's the diversity we are talking about? Ethnicity, gender, race, age, disability. So many dimensions. Uh, I often see that E in the DEAI is overlooked, equity. Uh, I think uh, that's a really tough one. And uh, we see an opportunity because the environmental, uh, social and governance ESG initiatives are going to be really important for investors, for customers, for partners, and going to push organizations to uh, look into these uh, data points and metrics. However, equity is often the overlooked one. Uh, and then I also had experience uh, 
uh, with uh, precisely, we have grown significantly 10 times within the last 10 years. And uh, both through organic as well as uh, through acquisitions, we had uh, 20 plus acquisitions in six years. So the wow. talent became global talent, uh, 2,500 plus people. And when we look at that, one part that I see where the DNI is overlooked during the acquisitions. Yeah. And we noticed that, and we actually made that part of our due diligence. Because you, you, you have these due diligence practices, you are going to do something and it happens. We were in a room after a very large acquisition where we doubled the size of the company. And uh, I was running a workshop, so we learn about each other practices. And this was a cross-functional one, uh, R&D, uh, pre-sales, uh, all engineering functions, as well as marketing and product management in the room. We had 60 people, only five women who came from one side of the house. And I was thinking, what happened here? Like, yes. <laughs> we overlooked something. Like, uh, uh, did we just acquire uh, white men? Uh, uh, what, what, what happened here? Which yeah. actually led to uh, the... Uh, founding the Precise Live Women in Technology Network with a uh, wonderful ally of mine from sales and uh, start doing something a little bit more programmatically. So the E, and uh, I often see that during the acquisitions we overlook. Yes, that's that's incredibly interesting actually to note, to, to note acquisitions because I think a lot of companies, they always think of their DNI efforts, as you, you know said, just in terms of their everyday recruiting, but suddenly when you find yourself with a couple of hundred um, employees that, that have been acquired into your business and suddenly you take a look back and uh, a step back and think, oh, actually, you know what, we really we really need to do something about um, the diversity that has now come into our company um, and uh, and work from the inside out um, is also a really great point. Um, yeah. You've obviously you've had a very successful career. Um, uh, what's been your experience as a female leader in tech have you, have you found it positive have you you know what what has been your experience so far so i worked in technology industry more than 25 years now and over this time i have seen the challenges that women faced firsthand that's why we are here talking about uh, women in technology otherwise i'm a big believer of diversity and inclusion for all dimensions of diversity it, it really is a business imperative and we have been talking about these challenges and the low rates of women representation for decades now. Um, yeah. I think there are always challenges. The challenges change as you grow in your career and take leadership roles. It's a different challenge when you are early in your career. career. If it's a different challenge when you are coming back from a parental leave. It's a different challenge when you are uh, VP level and uh, up, uh, uh, I, I would say. How do we turn those into opportunities becomes critical. Because uh, I was reading a, a study by Accenture and girls who code in the US, uh, and 50% of women who take a technology role uh, drop it by the age of 35. That was like oh. shocking number, yes. for them, right? Wow, 50%, that's very high. We are I wonder why we are underrepresented. And number one contributor to that was is the difficulty in advancing to the management and leadership roles. Then I started looking at data in our company, which was consistent with the industry, actually. Like at some point, it, I'm proud to say that we have about 30% uh, uh, women representation. We are not there yet, but we have goals and we are moving forward. Our leadership, again, is about 29% uh, uh, women when we look at the uh, uh, C-level leadership, which is, uh, I think, uh, great for precisely. And it does impact the success of the business. But when we look at uh, lower level management, there are challenges. And uh, I think for me, I will say, perhaps the pivoting point was once I became VP, and once I became higher level in the organization, I had the courage and the confidence to basically uh, say, 
I have to use my platform now and create more awareness, start advocating this as a business imperative, and also share our data. At that point, we were about, I think, 40% in R&D leadership. Because look at these other companies, Google, Twitter, uh, publishing their numbers, 17%, 18% representation. So we have something that we can be proud of, and we should be also aware that we should aim for 50% representation, right? So I think these barriers do still exist, partly down to company cultures, uh, partly down to education system. I think early education is key. Introducing the STEM careers, technology, coding, kudos to she can code. Uh, uh, early uh, education becomes key. And, uh, and then, um, giving back becomes key. Uh, I participate uh, in a, actually uh, STEM education opportunities. Uh, I'm part of a, a organization called Bridge to Turkey, and we focus on the poorest underrepresented um, areas in Turkey to bring technology labs, to bring STEM labs and uh, sponsor in particular students and uh, with the uh, 50% representation with girls so we can change that dynamics. So I think uh, it is really important uh, to think about what I as an individual can do in my organization and in my community to start doing something small that's going to have a ripple impact at some point. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. And so you you mentioned there, um, basically not pulling up the ladder behind you um, and that when you got into a position where you could make an impact you you um, took the reins and, and definitely uh, tried to do that uh, what do you think um, tech companies should be doing to encourage um, social mobility and improve diversity across the board you mentioned a couple of things there that you're doing yourself is, is there anything that you think tech companies should should be doing as a whole absolutely so first I think begin with the data uh, and uh, look at, assess the current situation in the organization in terms of the um, current percentages, uh, race representation, uh, gender representation, uh, ethnicity representation, start with the data and then uh, set practices in precisely actually uh, across the diversity and inclusion committee, precisely women in technology network and HR, we partnered to ensure that we have uh, diverse hiring practices and we monitor the talent pipeline. So what are the uh, representation of people applying for certain roles and how many of them actually become uh, employees and get hired, right? It's not just the application. You may have 38% uh, applicants women and only 10% are hired. You need to understand uh, what's happening there. What's the dynamic leading to that? Mm -hmm. And monitor their career progression after they are hired, showcase uh, diverse role models, but also see voluntary and involuntary attrition. So monitoring, setting some metrics and monitoring them and uh, improving them, uh, setting goals becomes important. That's one. Second, uh, what we are doing is uh, becoming an active par partner. And this is important for organizations. Uh, we partnered with uh, in the US with Girls Who Code as a corporate sponsor. They are uh, similar to She Can Code. They are actually dedicated to bringing coding and uh, technology uh, early uh, to girls. And I really like what She Can Code is doing. I see there's a lot of uh, focus in terms of technology blogs uh, and now the podcast series, uh, deep dive into certain technology topics and uh, enablement, not just for early uh, education, but also for uh, women in anywhere in their career. I like that uh, uh, kind of uh, focus. We also at Precisely partner with uh, Televerde, uh, our uh, one of our VP of sales, uh, Brenda K, uh, she leads that uh, program. It's a rehabilitation uh, 
program from correction facility. So bringing women back to workforce, that has been uh, also part of our uh, uh, being active partner. And then the third one is uh, create opportunities, right? And how do we create opportunities as organizations? Uh, we can uh, uh, do uh, financial donations, uh, corporate sponsored fundraisers in a uh, Giving Tuesday events. Uh, so we can actually directly channel uh, funds into sponsorships for underrepresented areas. Uh, and we have a lot uh, in the United States uh, as well. And uh, we can also do cre create internship opportunities with focus on uh, bringing people from underrepresented groups. Yes, yes. And thank you for mentioning she can code in there. Um, we, we do um, uh, try and share a, a range of tech stories um, because it is about that visibility, as you said, and, and sharing um, what people are doing and, and why it's important. Um, there has been a recent report uh, that found one in four um, have their accent mocked at work. Um, I am uh, so obviously I have to present this podcast um, and I am from uh, East London, a part of East London um, called Newham. And a lot of people in East London in that area moved out to Essex. And so when I was young, I became an Essex girl and there is a certain stereotype attached to it and a Cockney accent, obviously, that comes with it. Now, every workplace I go into, um, it's usually pointed out about my accent. I can dial it up and down um, for who I'm talking to. Obviously, this podcast, I have to try and remain as clear as possible and pronounce as many words as possible. Um, but I am one of those people that has you know, always entered the workplace and somebody has always mentioned something um, about my accent. Um, but, but do you think there, there is, um, you know, a, an accent bias have you you know and how do we counteract this if anything there's an accent bias everybody loves English accent and <laughs> <laughs> right? somebody starts talking like we are just like fascinated with it and we love it. Um, so that's why I like working in an international company <laughs> right, right. So I think it's very different now compared to 20 years ago compared to 30 years ago uh, because uh, if we look at the tech industry and the leaders, like even the CEOs of the Silicon Valley companies, it's hard to find someone without an accent. Yes. And that sets the tone because we have so many role models with an accent. When I came to the United States, uh, oh, I, people were asking me, like, are you from here? Are you from there? All the countries trying to understand. But I remember something uh, we were uh, acquired by uh, investor, uh, investors, basically. And uh, we were in a room and I was doing a lot of presentations. One of the very senior leaders uh, retired from IBM and part of that investor committee made a comment to the rest of the team, said, oh, in tech industry, you, you have to have an accent to be successful. And, he, okay. and then he said, one should not mix having an accent and clarity of thought. Yes. If you have clarity of thought that comes through your communication. An accent is just a kind of good, uh, it's like an accessory that uh, you have, it brings. That was a great, uh, I would say, confidence booster for me. Someone that I respect, and so senior in the room, coming from respectful background, making that statement. He almost set the tone in the room uh, for me, I would say. I think uh, now it's it's quite different. I, I really see everybody has an accent. Yes, and it's something as well that you, you, you know, I can't change my accent. As I mentioned, I can dial it up and down as to who I'm, I'm talking to. Um, but it is something that you can't change. And like we mentioned, you know, right at the beginning of this conversation, it's something that you you realize later into your career that you have to own where you're from, how you speak. Um, and 
you know people know as well if you're if you're um trying to be to trying to be different you you know you come across as quite fake um and i think it, people they they can spot that straight away so once you start to calm down and think you know what there are certain things about myself that i can't change um and i wouldn't want to change them either um and as you said as long as you're you're um clear um in the way that you communicate then why does it matter in terms of accent um or as you said um internationally people do like british accents so if not join an international company i worked at an american company and i had the same reaction um when i was the only brit they they never really um commented on my accent other than positive things about my accent um because americans just uh, love love the english accent you love it. yes you love it <laughs> um how can we challenge uh, preconceived assumptions people make about ourselves I liked what you just said, uh, Hayley, and uh, being authentic is important, right? Now, we cannot change people's perceptions. The only way we change people's perceptions is by bringing consistently bringing value, right? We have to do our jobs well at the end of the day. We have to bring value to the organization, whether it's a nonprofit organization or a uh, commercial organization, it doesn't matter. And uh, keep our authenticity and bring that individuality to the table. Individuality is actually is one of our values at uh, precisely. We say what makes us different makes us stronger. Now, yes. one thing that I will say for confidence, everybody has to obstacle their presentation skills. And there's no like end to that. Even today, I work on my presentation skills because how you present as an engineer, how you present as a manager, how you present as a C-level, how you present as a board member is different because your audience uh, changes and you have to really keep your presentation skills up to date. That helps with that confidence. And you have to stand up for, your, for yourself. Nobody is going to hand anything to you on a plate. You have to raise your hand, stand up for yourself, and uh, articulate how what you are doing, articulate what you are doing, and how that brings value to the business. That yeah. creates the confidence and changes the perception, I think. Yeah, and I think that's something when and, and that comes with experience, because I think when you're first in work, you you don't realize that you're allowed to do that. And I think um, being able to, to to even put your hand up and to, to clarify a point, I think when you first start, um, you you're not very clear about, you know, even your own role sometimes you don't even know what your own job is when when you first start um, but I think you're absolutely right as you as you um gain that experience it's, it's gaining that confidence to put to put your hand up and say you know this is me and this is what I do and and um to be able to communicate that um do you have any advice for our, our listeners um on how they can increase their confidence and and be proud of their background um first stay current stay current and pay attention to what's happening in the emerging technologies what is happening in your related industry or skill set uh, so you can kind of uh, upskill yourself on a continuous basis because we are seeing change at the speed that we have never seen before right there's a lot of uh, transformation is happening uh, with the, the businesses, with the digitization, with data-driven decision-making. So always key, uh, stay current uh, with the, uh, some of the skill sets uh, that will complement that. Second, the quicker you tie yourself um, into the business of the organization, uh, the quicker, quicker you tie what you are doing either to the optimizations, efficiencies, revenue growth, uh, partnerships, you are likely to grow. Because at the end of the day, you have to understand how your contribution impacts the goals of the organization. And you have to kind of uh, make that link. And the third, give back to your community. Get involved, support women in tech while being in women in tech. 
support uh, being uh, people of color while being uh, people of color. So giving back is important. And always remember your background, your accent, your uh, ethnicity, your uh, gender, your authentic yourself creates value for the organization. Because there are several studies by Deloitte, by McKenzie that shows that uh, diversity and bringing diverse perspectives creates value for the organization, um, increases uh, innovation because we are bringing different perspectives and uh, it increases uh, the company's actually likelihood of attracting uh, better talent because we wanna join companies aligned with our values and retention of uh, talent as well as it increases value with the ESG initiatives and with the investors. So your authenticity and individuality is a value for your organization. Always remember that. Yes, yeah, and, and, and you're right. I don't, pointing that out there, I think a lot of people don't realize their value in terms of that, their diversity and why, you know, why they were hired, not necessarily hired to, to tick a box. You know, it might necessarily be, somebody with an accent um, and you think just just your um, background and your story um, if you don't ever share that with anybody um, within the company uh, or, or, you know at a time obviously if you're working on a project and it becomes relevant um, if you don't share that then it is very hard to to show your own value um, and the opportunities is completely missed. Um, you mentioned there about women in tech networks, um, obviously, uh, and you're involved in a few yourself. Um, are there any particular resources that, that you would recommend to our listeners um, that are you know, looking to get ahead in their career? Any training courses or um, Sure. Um, <laughs> there are actually a couple of like general resources. Uh, it, it, of course, you have to really immerse yourself in the resources that are related to your field. However, we are seeing uh, a transformation where coding and data-driven decision-making is going to be important for every industry, every single industry. We are seeing telco companies becoming almost technology companies. We are seeing uh, 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 coffee uh, chains, your favorite coffee chains analyzing data. So coding and data-driven decision-making uh, is gonna be important no matter which area that you go and uh, start your career or advance your career. Uh, I will recommend uh, resources. Uh, there's a great blog in uh, Career Foundry, and that blog actually lists several free online resources, uh, including uh, data analytics and uh, uh, data science, but also in general, how do you make data-driven decisions? And cloud vendors like Amazon, uh, Azure, Google has uh, great free online training. Uh, Amazon uh, Skills actually has uh, uh, wonderful uh, training options. She can code podcasts and blogs. I went through them. Uh, they are actually great because you are focusing on uh, different uh, areas of technology and bringing that uh, at a level that any audience can understand and relate. And then there are chapters like Anita Borg chapter, uh, Women in IT Summit series. Uh, they provide resources that will be helpful as well. Lovely, Th thank you so much for sharing that. Tendu, I'm so sorry, we are already out of time. Um, the conversation uh, has been super interesting today. So thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to chat with us, it's really appreciated. Thank you so much and uh, thank you for having me. Thank you. We would love to have you back another time. So um, uh, be, be sure to hear for another invite from us uh, for, for another that. update. Wonderful. And to everybody listening, as always, thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you again next time.